I'm here as an international lawyer. I'm here to talk about justice. I'm here to talk about human rights. And I want to underline this. The language spoken here over the last days had a lot to do with scripture, with history, with biblical history. Regrettably, on the world stage, in the courts of the nations, in the places of power of the nations today, it's not a language or a medium that is received, understood, or accepted. Politics and law are a language and a medium that the nations have to listen to. And that's why I'm here today to talk to you about my conclusions after over 20 years of research with, with regard to the question, who owns Jerusalem in law? I know that the Jewish people, I know that Christians have an answer based on their faith in scripture in regard to that question. But come with me into another realm, the realm of international law. And the question is, who has title to this city, this holy city? It took me 20 years to put together these uh, 1,400 pages, this document with 3,000 footnotes, because after 10 years, I had the feeling that I, I knew nothing. There's so much written on this subject. There's so many articles, so many books, that there's nothing more humbling for a human being who wants to be a scholar, who thinks he understands law, to spend 10 years on, on a subject, and after 10 years, you realize you pick up a book and most of the references you've never seen before. So much has been written from an historical point of view, from a religious point of view, from a political point of view, because of our archaeology, politics. I believe I got the answer to the question. And I want to share my conclusions with you this morning. It's easy to get it wrong. In fact, what was most troubling is reading legal experts, names that are recognized by jurists, who come to certain conclusions, present their arguments, and it's totally contrary to what the next writer does. And that happens over and over and over again. It's like putting the pieces of a puzzle. I don't know who does puzzles here, but imagine a 10,000 piece puzzle. It takes so long for the picture to get together, and it's easy to get it wrong. Many centuries ago, the Hebrew leader, Nehemiah, according to Hebrew scripture, according to Christian scripture, came just a, a short distance from here to rebuild the walls and gates of Jerusalem. And there was opposition. There was great opposition. And among those who opposed him was Geshem the Arab. Interesting. So long ago, an Arab opposing a, a, an Hebrew leader considered to be one of the greatest biblical leaders for the Hebrew people. And when challenged, he faced the opposition and said... The God of heaven will grant us success, and we, his servants, will start building. But you have no share or claim or stake in Jerusalem. You have no title. Here we are, 21st century, and Jewish leaders are proclaiming to the world concerning Jerusalem, it's ours. You others do not have a valid legal claim. That doesn't mean they don't have any rights at all. Please understand, I'm talking about rights to sovereignty. I'm not saying they have no civil rights or rights to, to under the religious headings. They have them. But let's talk about sovereignty. When the Jewish leadership of today says, 
It is ours. We're entitled to be here. We are not trespassers. We're not occupiers. We're not here wrongfully. Is it right, legally, for them to say that? Surely, the issue of Jerusalem and my focus, the old city, and you'll understand why in a moment I've focused on the old city, is one of the core issues. Many believe that no peace treaty will ever come unless that issue, and more specifically, the question of the old city, is resolved. Any solution, plan, or legal disposition regarding this question incorporated in a peace agreement which does not deal with the status of the old city will only result in a very superficial temporary peace. You need today to come with me into history and to events of history to understand why the old city is so vital. Let me present to you the positions of the claimants. This is legal stuff. There's a court. Pretend there's a court and there's a claim presented by Israel saying, we claim sovereignty over all of Jerusalem, including West Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, and the Old City. The Palestinian Authority is claiming sovereignty over at least East Jerusalem and the Old City. Generally, those who support the Palestinian claim to sovereignty over East Jerusalem and the Old City refer to the area comprising both East Jerusalem and the Old City as East Jerusalem. Very seldom do they point out that when they talk about East Jerusalem, it includes the Old City. They refer to it as Arab Jerusalem without specifying ever that they mean an area that includes the Old City. Prime Minister Netanyahu has declared repeatedly we will never divide Jerusalem. President Abbas has stated that the status of Jerusalem as the future capital of the Palestinian state is a red line that no Palestinian leader is committed to cross or permitted in any way to transgress. He made this statement in Bethlehem at the major conference they had there in August 2009. And what's interesting is that in a FATA official report presented at the conference, it's on the line that FATA will continue to sacrifice victims until Jerusalem will be returned, clean of settlements and of settlers. I am here to argue, and I'm prepared to argue this for the rest of my life, that the Jews who are in this city are not settlers. They're here as of right. The Jews that are in this city are not wrongfully here. They're here as of right. And I'm referring to international law. Jerusalem is the center of the conflict because possession of it is a symbol of the success of a national dream and a pol political doctrine, while the failure to possess it is evidence of the lost dream and the failure of one's political doctrine. The problem relating to Jerusalem is not yet answered, and we're far from an answer because of lack of knowledge and understanding of the root causes of this exceedingly difficult problem. I feel extremely uncomfortable with the Dennis Rosses of this world who want to sit down at a negotiation table and take the position that, in order to get to the solution, the parties and the claimants must forget about their myths and their fantasies. Let's get realistic. Let's be pragmatic, is the approach taken by those who think like Dennis Ross, and I dare say the current president of the United States. What's the position of Hamas on this? Their leader in Damascus, Meshal, has stated, Jerusalem's fate will be decided by holy war and resistance and not by negotiations. Jerusalem is all of Jerusalem. We're not talking about East Jerusalem. Not only East, but West. The Arabs and Muslims are residents and the Zionists have no claim over it. 
Does all those words remind you of anything I read a few moments ago? The leader of Hamas saying, you Jewish people have no claim or title to Jerusalem. Hezbollah's position, the leader Nasrallah takes the position that the Islamic nation, he's now speaking for Islam, has an historic commitment to Jerusalem. Palestine and the Palestinian people are our cause. Palestine from sea to river is entirely Arab property. Nasrallah believes that jihad is the only way to achieve the results they want to achieve. Of course, Hezbollah is supported and subsidized by Iran. What's the position of Iran? Their leader, Ahmadinejad, has called for the abolishment of the Jewish state and declared that all of Palestine must be liberated from Israeli hands. And that includes all of Jerusalem. Position of the US. The Obama administration has taken the position over the last months that East Jerusalem should become the capital of the new Palestinian state. And as a result, that all the Jewish neighborhoods in Eastern Jerusalem are, quote, settlements and, quote, illegitimate. illegitimate. Position of the Arab League. Basically, they want everything liberated along the 1967 borders. Position of the International Quartet, that's US, UN, Europe, and Russia, is basically the same as the position of the Arab League. They want all the territories prior to the 1967 war to be returned to the Palestinians and become part of the Palestinian state. The United Nations, has played a very significant role over the last half century. Both the General Assembly and the Security Council have treated East Jerusalem not only as occupied territory, but as Palestinian occupied territory. One of the things, there, there may be about 10 things I want you to remember today, and I'll pray that you will remember these things. For a jurist to say, that what is referred to as the West Bank is occupied territory is accurate. And I'll explain that. To say that it is occupied Palestinian territory is invalid. There's a difference between the two. Because you see, under the law of war, and there is war between Israel and a number of its neighbors, a state of war legally, until the matter is finally determined and settled, there is occupation. The world and the media of the world have turned this word into a bad word. It's a nasty connotation. But forget not that this very area we're sitting in or standing in today was occupied by the British from the time they defeated the Turks all the way technically till 1923 when the Treaty of Lausanne was signed. Occupation is what happens when somebody takes over a territory until there's a legal determination of the status. Yes, it's occupied. But my conclusion is that it is occupied Jewish territory. The UN takes the position that it has a legitimate right to question the status of the city of Jerusalem and to, to pass resolutions in respect to the city. And I don't disagree with this, because it's a role that the League of Nations used to have, and the UN has a role to play. Supervision role, yes, but it cannot change the terms, the legal terms that were settled long ago, which I'll tell you about in a moment. You're looking now at uh, the extension of the borders of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem that took place in first in 1967 and then 1993. And you'll note that little yellow dot or square in the middle, right in the middle, that's the old city. What I want you to understand is the location of the Green Line. The Green Line is referred to in so many documents and articles and resolutions as if 
it was sacred. As if it was meant to be legally the source of rights and obligations of Israelis and Jews and others. I disagree with that, and I'll explain why. But look at where the green line is. Article 2 of the agreement that was made in 1949 between Israel and Jordan, this is a cornerstone of my argument, specifies that there's no provision, even though there's a, a line where they'll stop the fighting and they'll divide up territory, that there's no provision in the agreement that's in any way supposed to prejudice the rights, claims, or positions of either party. How clear is that? Do you need to go to law school for three years or more to understand what that says? The green line is only relevant in respect to the law of war and where the parties stop fighting. It is not a source of rights and obligations. What would happen if Jerusalem was divided according to the green line, as is demanded by so many of the interested parties? Look at it. All that would be left is the dark blue segment, East Jerusalem, uh, West Jerusalem, and the, the, the light blue is the, the, the adjacent territory of the Jewish state, and what's left of Jerusalem, you'll see, will be completely surrounded by the light green, which is the Palestinian state, and the dark green would be the capital of the new Palestinian state. When I speak about these things with journalists and with uh, different ones around the world, and I show them this picture, usually the reaction is, oh, I, I, I didn't realize that the ramifications would be so significant. What I'm here to tell you about today, as a scholar, as a jurist, is what I have tested, what I have looked at, and because I had to defend my thesis in the Graduate Institute in Geneva, I was not allowed any leeway. There's no margin for exaggerations here. What I'm telling you are the historical facts and the realities, and I am prepared to meet anyone and discuss these things with anyone. This is accurate. Again, look at Jerusalem today. Look at how many Jewish communities would have to be dismantled, removed. Every dark blue area, and there are more now. This map is dated now. There, there are even more areas. There, there's a lot of expansion. Look at what happens if you remove Jewish communities as a result of this green line, which is merely a line where people stop fighting. Let's talk about the old city. You'll, you'll note that uh, it's divided in sections. Many of you were probably there over the last days. And there are really five sections. You see them. And, of course, the most sacred hot zone religiously and politically of all, the Temple Mount. I should add that, uh, as far as the claimants are concerned, not long ago, Jordan was a claimant. But in 1988, they abandoned their claim and uh, assigned their rights, in effect, to the Palestinians. My position is that they had no legal rights under international law to assign, so the Palestinians really received nothing from the Jordanians. It would, I have a chapter on this in my thesis. I can't go into the details, but that's what happened. You recall that uh, after 1949, Jordan had annexed uh, the so-called West Bank, and uh, they were considered belligerent occupants. Again, occupation per se is not illegal. Under the law of war, you're told what to do and not to do. And I'm not even here to tell you that Israel has not contravened provisions of treaties linked to the law of war, but it has nothing to do with sovereignty. So the, the old city of Jerusalem. Why am I so interested in the old city? Look at the, the configuration of Jerusalem in the first century B.C., uh, first century A.D. 
you'll note that it's very similar to the current dimensions or the current configuration of the old city. In, 19, in uh, 135 AD, the Romans, who had completely, completely destroyed Jerusalem, rebuilt it and renamed it. And look at the, the, the configuration of the city then. It's basically the configuration of the walls of the old city today. Why am I focusing on that? I want you to understand that over the centuries, Look at Jerusalem in the 12th century. That's a crusader Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem. This is a, I, I'm a collector of lithographs. This is a lithograph of, of Jerusalem in the mid-19th century. And this is a plan of Jerusalem in a French book uh, in, mid, in the middle of the 19th century. This is not such a long time ago. And you'll note that there's almost nothing outside the walls. Why is this significant? It means that from the time it was rebuilt by the Romans, 135 AD, or even before when it was a Jewish Jerusalem before destruction by the Romans, through the centuries, if you took a picture of Jerusalem in the 16th century, in the 17th century, Jerusalem is the old city. The true Jerusalem, the sacred Jerusalem, in the minds and hearts of the claimants, is the old city. By the way, those who claim in different places that there was never a Jewish temple, this is a, a side note, I invite all of you to do what I did with my family. We uh, went to Rome and saw the Arch of Titus, or Arco de Tito, that's the way it looks today. I took the picture. Inside the, the walls of, the, uh, of this magnificent, gigantic arch are depictions of the Jewish prisoners carrying the sacred emblems of the temple. This scene is described in great detail by uh, Josephus in, in this wonderful work of history. For those who claim there's no such thing as a temple, well, the Romans were somewhat helpful here, having done so many terrible things to the Jewish people. Here, here we are with details, details of what was taken from the temple. Here's a photograph of Jerusalem in the early 20th century. You'll see that there are a few neighborhoods, a few areas around the walls, outside of the walls of the old city, but not much. Let's continue with the, the roots of title, the key events of, of history, which result in the title being given to the Jewish people. And I stress the Jewish people, because when it was given in 1920, there was no state. I go back to history because I want you to understand the Jewish claim that was presented in Paris in 1919. I did a lot of reading to understand what the objectives of Zionism's movement were back then. The author that touched me the most, and I recommend reading his work, was Moses Hess. He wrote Rome and Jerusalem in 1862, and his work is far more articulate far more sensitive than the thesis published later by Herzl. It's marvelous. One of the things that he said was, what we have to do at present for the generation of the Jewish nation is first to keep alive the hope of the political rebirth of our people. Note that he's talking birth of a people here. It's very important that you remember this because recognition is given to this later. And next, to reawaken the hope where it slumbers, when political conditions in the Orient shape themselves so as to permit the organization of a beginning of the restoration of a Jewish state. Ultimately, the question will have to be answered, what were the Jewish people asking for? They were asking for recognition 
of the Jewish people as a people in the law of nations and the right to establish a Jewish nation. You know that that's an issue even today. Leo Pinsker wrote Auto Emancipation in 1882, and that's also an amazing articulation of what the Jewish people were looking for. But I have to move to Herzl. He wrote his thesis in 1896, and he got his doctorate. It's not fair. His thesis is only about 90 pages, and he got a doctorate for it. You know how much work I had to do to get mine. And yet, he is referred to as one of the fathers of modern Israel. Why? Please note the, the title and subtitle. The Jewish State, an attempt at a modern solution to the Jewish question. The Jewish question. 1896, that's published. And yet, it's not this publication that turns everything around for the Jewish people. It's what happens in Basel, Switzerland, one year later. And here, if I can be allowed another footnote. Here, an idea, a concept is put forward. The establishment of a Jewish state to deal with the problem faced by the Jews for centuries and centuries and centuries. And when people refer to the Jewish problem as the problem of the Jews, I say no. It's the problem of the nations. The nations should be ashamed when they look at the history of the way the Jews have been treated throughout the centuries. It's not a Jewish problem, it's a problem of the nations. What happens in Basel is crucial because for, for once, the Jews unite, they assemble. They're so often disagreeing with one another and divided. And to the extent that there's a Jewish person hearing me today, I would say, as an advocate, it's not a good time to be divided because the nations want to take away what belongs to you. You've got to stand together. And we, who are not Jewish, who are interested in justice, who are interested in human rights, have to stand with them. In addition to those including those here today who have beliefs based on their faiths, whether it's Jewish faith or Christian faith. I am not here for a moment to tell you that you're not to pursue what you believe because of Scripture, but I'm saying to you that apart from Scripture, notwithstanding whatever is in Scripture, there's an issue of justice, of international justice here. And people of goodwill, people with a conscience, do not have the right to allow the nations to take away from the Jewish people what they have been given already. So they assemble in 1896, 1897 in Basel, and, and set out a strategy to establish a Jewish state. Have to move forward quickly. What happens next is uh, Herzl dies, Wiseman takes over, and I have spent years of my life reading the writings of Heim Wiseman. He's really an idol, a, a hero for me, someone that I admire because he was so tenacious, so determined, so faithful to his cause, the cause of Zion. It was because of his work and the work of others in England that the Balfour Declaration was issued in 1917. And you have the text of the Declaration here. And I can't spend a lot of time on this, but it is a pledge of the, not one man, not Balfour, it's the war cabinet under Lloyd George, needing the help of the Jews in Russia and the United States and other places, making a pledge that is binding on England, but not on the nations. And a lot of the stuff that I read in articles and books gives the impression that 
Balfour, that declaration is the foundation. And then those who attack the entitlement of the Jewish people merely need to point out that England didn't have the right to give anything. It was fighting in the Middle East. It was the, 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 a, a big uh, force in, in dealing with the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, but it didn't have title to give. In Latin, we say, nemo dat quad non habit. You can't give what you don't have. So those who argue that this is not a valid foundation are right. And it leads to a lot of confusion. Here's Balfour. He wrote it to the leader of the, Zion, the British Zionist Federation, Rothschild. Let me take you now to the turning point. I've, I've presented elements which are crucial in understanding my argument, my conclusions. <coughs> but everything turns around from a legal point of view in Paris. This is when I want you to listen carefully. Imagine the Paris Peace Conference taking place at the, the Quai d'Orsay, which is still on the in the middle of Paris, I was there just recently, and it's a beautiful building where the, the Foreign uh, Affairs Department has its headquarters. And for six months, different parties after the war are claiming territorial rights. I want to focus on what the Zionists presented, the Zionist delegation, a Zionist organization led by Wiseman, and what the Arab delegation presented. The Arab delegation was, was led by the Ashamite family. They were the prime rulers of Arabia in those days. Can't forget this. Not long later, they were replaced by the Saudi family. But in those days, it was the Ashamites. The leader was Hussein, he was the, the, uh, in Mecca, he was referred to as the sheriff and emir of Mecca. He was the king of the territory known as Ejaz. Three sons, and the one he sends to Paris is Faisal. It's important because Faisal meets with the leader of the Zionist movement, Wiseman, in Paris. This is a picture of them meeting in 1918, but in, in Paris, not only do they meet, but they enter into an agreement which specifies that the two movements complete one another. The Jewish movement is national, not imperialist. Our movement is national and not imperialist. There's room for us both. What he's saying is that they want a new, big, independent uh, state. Uh, lo look at what they're asking for. They, they wanted a large independent Arab state, not a bunch of little Arab states, but one. And they realized that they were asking for so much that they had to support the Zionist claim in, um, in respect to Palestine. So this is not talked about very much, but this is the truth. I have a copy of the agreement for anyone who wants to see it, where the Arab delegation is willing to support the Zionist group. There is no Palestinian de delegation. It, there's no distinct people known as the Palestinians. The Arabs prior to the war were, were not known as, as, a, as a united people at all. They were famous for how divided they were into tribes and clans. Here's another point you must not forget. In Paris, there the Allied powers meet to listen to the claims and to decide on what to do after the war. But there were five nations, and particularly four men, who were the principal allied powers. And the root of the title of the Jewish people comes out of this. Here on the picture, you've got Wilson, Lloyd George, Orlando, and Clemenceau. They are the leaders of four of the principal uh, allied powers. The fifth is Japan. The case of the Jewish people, what they wanted to present in Paris, is marvelously summarized in a publication by Sasher in 1919. I can't go into it now, but what's important for you to remember is that even though the Jewish people wanted a state, they constituted a minority of the population in Palestine in those days. 800, maybe 800,000 Arabs and barely 150 to 200,000 Jews. 
So they had to find a formula, they had to find an approach which would enable them to get a state but not right away. So they'd have to bring in a friendly nation to be a trustee, like the womb of a mother, to allow the child to, to, to grow, and then after sufficient immigration, independence would be declared, even though they asked for the entitlement to sovereignty during the Paris Peace Conference. Here's the leader that I've referred to, who played such a key role, and in my view, is more the father of modern Israel than any other Jewish fighter. Here are the conditions they were asking for. Okay, imagine a courtroom. If you're pleading a case in front of judges, you come usually with a statement which is called a statement of claim. That's what you're asking for. You want that. Until the judges decide, we recognize and accept your demand and your claim, you have nothing. However, if your claim is received, recognized, and accepted by a body, a judicial group that has the power of disposition, that's the key. If you go in front of someone who can't decide, then you're wasting your time. But this is the Supreme Council with the power of disposition. And they're asking for the right to reconstitute their national home based on historic title. Huge, huge concept. If accepted ever, the ramifications are humongous. They're asking to be recognized as a people, they're asking for recognition of their historic right, and they're asking for the right to reconstitute. Because if you reconstitute, that means what was there before, including what was here in Jerusalem, has to be honored and respected. Do you understand the significance of these words? It's everything turns on what they're asking for and what they were given. The territory where they were claiming is roughly what you see on the map. On, there was territory on both sides of the Jordan River, and if you look at the division of, of uh, the land, the holy land among the 12 tribes, it's amazing how much uh, there's a similarity. Every tribal uh, allocation or allotment is covered by the map requested by wise men in Paris. Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, just a word on this, it was attached to the Treaty of Versailles, signed after the Peace Conference, and it, con it contains another cornerstone of my argument. The principle of a sacred trust over certain territories to be established where instead of nations just taking over what they'd conquered, these nations are going to allow a trustee or a mandatory to take over for somebody else, for the well-being and development of a people. And they call that a sacred trust of civilization. Today, I have concluded that that sacred trust is still in effect and binding, and that the nations have an, oblig an obligation to look after the well-being and the development of a certain people here, the Jewish people. How neglected, how forgotten, how discarded, how violated this principle has been. I, I'm showing you a treaty that was signed in, as a result of the negotiations in Paris just to remind you that those who receive the power to allot and convey territory, and that really matters in law, are the principal powers. Do you see United States, British, France, Italy, and Japan? And you'll see under Article 48 that in this case it's Bulgaria that is conveying all the rights to those nations, which means those nations can then turn around and give that territory to others. Again, in the Treaty of Versailles, Germany gives up its rights. Who gets the power to deal with those territories? The principal allied powers. Treaty of Trianon. Again, this has to do with Hungary. Who gets the rights? Those four nations. 
they could do whatever they wanted. And I have a map showing you Europe that has been reconfig reconfigured and restructured to enable, uh, to, to, to confirm, to give you evidence of the power of the principal allied powers. The Ottoman territories. What happens in Paris? The, these powers have heard the submissions, they've heard the claims, but they're too busy and they leave Paris without making a decision. They reconvene to deliberate. When they reconvene, it's not to hear submissions anymore. The submissions have been heard. The cases have been presented. They know what the Zionist organization wants. They know what the Arab wants. Where do they meet? And this is the most startling discovery of 20 years of research. I had never really heard about the San Remo conference. They meet in a villa. Here they are. I was so stunned by the significance of this that I took my wife and one of our four daughters and we went to this villa and uh, to see if it truly existed. And today it's been redesigned as a modern um, fancy condominium. And one of the owners offers his apartment to rent and I was able to move into the apartment for a few days. That's where the windows open there. And it's a very room in the Villa de Vachon, which has been upgraded, it's now a castle, and where the leaders, here they are. And nobody's seen these pictures. While I was there, an old German woman who was about 95 years old came to me and says, I heard about your work. Here are pictures from that era. Amazing for those who don't believe that these are true historical events, the source of rights and obligations for the Jewish people. And here are, I, I found the minutes of the, of, of, of the meetings that took place there. Crucial dates, April 24, April 25. Crucial dates for the Jewish people. Crucial dates for the Arabs. Because that's where a decision was made to give certain territories, and they had the right to, to do this, the power of disposition, to the Arabs, Mesopotamia, now Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And they did that. Great day for the Arabs. Important, significant turning point for the Jewish people because they decide to honor the commitments of the Balfour Declaration. Remember what I told you before? The British couldn't do it. The Balfour Declaration was really important as a political incentive, as it encouraged the movement. It was vital. It was great politically. It did a lot for the Zionist movement, but it wasn't a source of rights and obligations under international law. This decision of the leaders gathered in Paris, uh, in uh, Saint Remo, was. Here's a picture of the table where they sat, and at the bottom you'll see four chairs. It's a U-shaped table. And that's the room that I was in, in Saint Remo. If you think I'm exaggerating the significance of this event, and I speak to a lot of Jewish audiences. I've been privileged to, to be welcome in many settings, and it's stunning to speak to such a learned, educated, wise people. And yet I tell them about Saint Remo, and they don't know. And they look at me funny, and they think, well, maybe you're making a little too much of this, Dr. Gauthier. But I say, wait a minute. Here's what Wiseman said about it. The San Remo decision has come. That recognition of our rights in Palestine is embodied in the treaty with Turkey, the Treaty of Sev, and has become part of international law. This is the most momentous political event in the whole history of our movement, Zionist movement, and it is perhaps no exaggeration to say in the whole history of our people since the exile. Did you read this? Did you hear me? The moment of creation of the rights for the Jewish people to the city and to the Holy Land was there in St. Remo. A treaty was drafted shortly thereafter, the Treaty of Sèvres, and you'll see that there are four of the five nations I've referred to because the U.S. pulled out for, for different reasons, but the principal powers that are set out here, and, and again, the 
treaty recognizes what happened. It, it, it codifies, it, it repeats what was decided in St. Remo. And here are the treaties that emanate in respect to the territories. There's a mandate for Syria and Lapen, uh, in Lebanon given to the French. And I want to focus on the fact that this is for the population inhabiting the mandate mandated territory. Is it clear that all of this treaty is for people, the inhabitants who are basically Arab people? Iraq. I, I took the key article from the treaty with Iraq. Who is it for? Look at the language, very similar to the mandate for, for Syria and Lebanon. It's for the inhabitants of that territory. But what about the mandate for Palestine? The equivalent article, Article 2, refers to only one people, the Jewish people. In this mandate, Jewish people are given recognition as a people. In this mandate, there's only reference to the civil and religious rights of the inhabitants of Palestine. The political rights, rights to title, rights to sovereignty are given to the Jewish people. This clause refers to the, you'll note that it refers to the preamble, which becomes a key component of the dis disposition clause. It's so important. In the mandate for Palestine, which I found so amazing, was drafted by Arthur Balfour. You'll understand the significance of that. The very clause that the Jewish people ask for in Paris, that they wanted the recognition of their historical connection and the right to reconstitute their national home. You remember this huge thing they were asking for? The principal powers who had the power of disposition said, yes, you can have it. And here it is. It's in the preamble, and the preamble is in the crucial article. I've put all three provisions next to each other. There's no reference to any preamble in, in the other mandates. And it's so clear when you compare the three that Arabs were supposed to be the beneficiaries of the trust and the mandate in the other territories and the Jews in Palestine. What happens? The mandate is set up over that entire area. Is it honored by the nations? No. In 1921, Churchill, under pressure because the French had kicked out Faisal out of uh, Syria, agrees to partition Palestine and give the largest chunk of it to the Arabs. But under the leadership of an Arab who came from another part, from Arabia, he was an Ashamite, Abdullah, the brother of Faisal. Today, the Jews, the Jewish people, the state of Israel, are fighting to retain what was West Palestine, when the very leader of Jordan back then said, in order, in, in, in recognition and consideration for what he was getting, he would support a Jewish state in West Palestine. My last comments, having presented to you the cornerstones, the roots of title, is to say to you that nothing that has happened since then has taken away the rights given to the Jewish people, first, in St. Remo, then in the provisions of the Mandate for Palestine. The dissolution of the League of Nations in 1946 did not change that. The League of Nations was only to supervise rights already given. When the United Nations was set up, established, provisions of its charter, Article 80, specified that in, and this is a treaty signed by all the nations, Nothing in what we're doing is meant in any manner to alter the rights previously given to any peoples. Do you see that? This is our, check out Article 80. Why is the world disregarding such obligations? The Partition Resolution, 1947. Resolution of the General Assembly. Remember, these are not binding resolutions in international law. Only the Security Council can bind the nations. 1947, this resolution is passed. 
accepted by the Jewish people, rejected by the Arabs. It has no legal effect. It is not a source of rights and obligation. It would have been if both parties had accepted it and put the provisions in a treaty. That resolution, incidentally, provided for a separate status for Jerusalem. It wasn't a going to the Arab state. There was going to be a referendum after 10 years. And you know for how long Jews were a majority in Jerusalem? Do you know what would have happened after 10 years of immigration? There would have been an overwhelming majority of Jews in Jerusalem. Who would have won the referendum? What would have happened to Jerusalem? Everybody forgets inconvenient truth. It was a special regime, in fact, that went beyond Jerusalem that included Bethlehem. What's happened to Bethlehem since is something that we, we should all be ashamed of. 1960, 50, 55, 66, there were decisions of the International Court of Justice which make it clear that the dissolution of the League of Nations did not take away from the rights given under mandates. I want to conclude with a few observations and a comment on the Quran and all this. My conclusion is that the Jewish people have never renounced their claim or right to the old city or any part of Jerusalem. They've never formally abandoned the right to receive title, sovereignty. But the nations refuse to recognize any longer these claims because of other political doctrines like the doctrine of self-determination, which was not relevant. And there's a principle in international law that says you can't retroactively apply legal principles. The Jewish people have the legal right to remain in each and every part of the territory which was part of the mandata mandated territory. They have the right, if they want, to give up what is theirs, but they cannot be pushed out. The nations have reneged on the obligations that they embraced when the League of Nations in 1922 adopted the mandate for Palestine. What I want you to remember today is that when you hear Jews, when you hear Christians say they have a good claim to Jerusalem, I want you to remember that under the law of nations, under international law, they have a very solid, valid claim which ought to be honored by the nations today. Thank you. I mentioned that I would say a word about the, the, the Quran. Um, it has to do with centrality. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to mention this, and I'll feel badly if I don't mention it before I go. Those who say that Jerusalem is holy in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are right. It is holy in all three faiths. Those who say, and I read it everywhere, that it is central in Judaism, Christianity and Islam are wrong. Jerusalem is only central in Judaism. Mecca is the center of Islam. And I have a, a chapter in my thesis which compares the reasons why it's so central and, and, and sacred to the Muslims, and they're very similar to the reasons why Jerusalem is so sacred and central to the Jews. But it's Mecca. For the Christians, we Christians are divided as well. If you are Roman Catholic, the center is Rome. If you doubt that, visit the Sistine Chapel. When Rome was designated as the new Jerusalem, the new center of the world for, for Christians, the Sistine Chapel is not built as your traditional Roman, uh, Roman Catholic structure. It's a rectangular structure the dimensions of which are identical to the dimensions of Solomon's temple. When you're inside, if you want to know what it was like inside Solomon's temple, go inside the Sistine Chapel. Because 
the Vatican was the new center for the Catholics. If you're Russian Orthodox, there's a compound which I visited in Moscow, which is their center. Yes, Jerusalem is exceedingly holy to Christians, but it is not the center of everything. And for me to summarize the reasons it is sacred and central in Judaism, I had to do 50 executive summaries so that I wouldn't take up my whole thesis because of so many reasons why it was central. So again, truth and falsehood. It is holy to all three faiths. It is not central to all three. Thank you for allowing me to add this footnote. Okay. Shit.